Well, welcome everybody. And I think a few more people will be joining us. Um, you may have already heard that um, the chat room is not apparently working, which is not intentional, but the Q&A area is. So along uh, today, if you have any questions, just go ahead and pop those into the Q&A and then Lauren will help share those with our speakers. Welcome to our August virtual lecture, which is sponsored by Montecito Bank and Trust. Thank you, Montecito Bank. My name is Stacy Adi Demangate, and I'm the executive director here at the Lawling Museum of Art and Nature. And we're very excited to have two scientists from NASA joining us today to share how they're able to track what's happening with ice on our planet from space, which I don't understand how that works, but I think we're gonna figure that out pretty soon. So we're doing this program in conjunction with our climate change exhibition called Fire and Ice, Our Changing Landscape, um, which several amazing artists through their artwork kind of help connect us to the issue of climate change. Our show is part of a larger regional effort to talk about climate change. And there are actually 14 museums that have come together as part of the Environmental Alliance of Santa Barbara County Museums and everybody's doing programming or exhibitions about this very important topic this summer. And uh, you can learn more um, at the Museum Alliance website, which I will at some point type into the chat room, and that's sbmuseumsalliance.org. Uh, we do have another exhibition related virtual lecture coming up in September, and that'll be on September 15th, and that's by two of the artists in our Fire and I show, Suze Wolf and writer Lorena Williams. So uh, again, that information will be on our website and on our social media if you wanna learn more and sign up later. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our speakers um, and I appreciate them coming in. They're in different time zones and different parts of the country uh, from Colorado and Maryland. So the, our Maryland person, it's seven o'clock their time. So it's a little late and we really appreciate you making that time given that it's later there. So thank you guys so much for being here. So Dennis Felixson is, has a PhD and he works in the cryospheric sciences lab at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. And his research focuses on measurements and models of Earth's ice sheets to understand how they've changed in the past and help improve projections of what we think might be happening with sea level rise. He is also the data product lead for the, I'm reading this carefully, <laughs> for the ATL06 product on ISAT2, and he's a member of NASA's sea level change team. So very important work. So welcome, Dennis. And I think Dennis will be leading us off, but I'll go ahead and do the intro for Steven, who will uh, be the next presenter. Stephen Fons is a postdoctoral researcher with the Cryospheric Sciences Lab at the, also at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, um, working remotely from Colorado. And he's studying sea ice using a combination of satellite altimetry and in situ measurements. And he received his PhD from the University of Maryland researching Antarctic sea ice using the satellite radar altimeter Cryosat 2. And currently he's using data collected on the year long Mosaic Expedition, which stands for Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. And he spent more than five months in the Arctic Ocean, hopefully on a boat or on ice, <laughs> collecting sea ice samples. And then he uses those measurements to help improve how they retrieve ice samples um, from the cryoset and ice set to altimeters. I hope I did you guys okay as far as all of that goes, all very precise language. So <laughs> with that, I'm very happy to turn it over to um, Dennis. I think you're starting. Yes, well, thank you for that excellent introduction. Thanks to <laughs> Stacy and Lauren and the Wilding Museum for having us. Um, it's always nice to, to be able to do talks like this. Um, and uh, I appreciate you guys hosting us virtually because if it wasn't for that, we probably would not have connected. So that's great. So thanks for having us both. My name is Dennis. Um, I'll be starting us off and then I'll turn it over to Stephen for the second half of the talk. And today we're gonna talk to you guys about measuring Earth's ice from space. So our talk is called A Precise Look at Ice, um, how we're measuring 
the Earth's cryosphere with centimeter accuracy from space. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to you about ICESat-2, which is a satellite mission that's flown by NASA. ICESat-2 was launched in 2018. We'll tell you guys about the satellite and about the measurements that it's making and about the results that we're seeing from that satellite. And specifically, we're going to be focusing our talk on the ice sheets and on sea ice. And so the Earth has two ice sheets. Here, what we're showing is a uh, satellite image of the Greenland ice sheet. That's in the Northern Hemisphere. And the Antarctic ice sheet is the ice sheet that's in the Southern Hemisphere. And our satellite, our little satellite here, ISAT-2 measures both of those ice sheets on every orbit, every time it orbits the Earth. Um, there's also two poles of sea ice. There's sea ice in the north, which is floating. Um, sea ice is flo frozen ice that floats out in the ocean. Um, and Stephen is going to talk to you a lot more about what sea ice is and what measurements we're taking there. But I'm going to focus on ice sheets. But first, we want to tell you all, um, why do we care? What, why do we measure uh, ice from space? Why is it important? Um, I'll give you two important reasons. First of all, uh, the ice sheets are shrinking, and that shrinking ice contributes directly to sea level rise. Um, this is a chart that shows measured sea level change around the globe from uh, the early 90s to present day. Uh, global sea level is rising, and about half of this rise is comes directly from melting ice around uh, the world. The ice sheets and glaciers when that ice melts, the water ends up in the ocean, and as a result, we get sea level rise. And we're getting about three millimeters of rise per year, and we think it's starting to accelerate, which is not a great thing. Um, and that three millimeters per year can add up uh, to, to a lot over, over a longer time period, like a, the next 100 years. Another very important reason, uh, and this has to do uh, with sea ice and land ice, is that uh, ice uh, affects Earth's albedo. The albedo is the measurement of how much sunlight is reflected back into outer space by the Earth. Ice is very bright, it's white, and very reflective. So when sunlight enters the atmosphere, uh, it reflects off of the ice a lot more efficiently than it reflects off of other darker surfaces. And so that energy gets bounced back into outer space and it's not absorbed by the earth. Um, because ice is shrinking, both sea ice is shrinking and, uh, and the ice sheets are shrinking, earth, the earth is actually on average becoming darker. And uh, as the earth's albedo gets, gets darker, it absorbs more and more energy and uh, this can have a pos what we call a positive feedback. So as the Earth absorbs, absor absorbs excuse me, more sunlight, more of the ice melts, the albedo goes down, less sunlight is reflected back into space, and the cycle continues. So it's very important to, uh, to measure both ice sheets and sea ice to, to understand how they're changing and to try to use those, that understanding to predict what might happen in the future. So. The way we do that uh, at NASA is from uh, primarily from satellites, although we also fly airborne missions to collect measurements over these icy parts of the Earth. And today we're going to talk about one of those satellites, and it's called ISAT-2. ISAT-2 stands for the Ice Cloud and Land Elevation Satellite 2. Why 2? Because it's a follow-on to a previous satellite mission that was called ISAT. Uh, ISAT-2 is NASA's premier ice focused satellite. So it's the, the one satellite that NASA is operating right now that's main mission is to make measurements of the ice. For those of you folks who are out near the Wildling Museum on the West Coast, uh, you may have seen launches from Vandenberg, uh, Vandenberg, excuse me, Air Force Base. This is a video of the launch of ISAT-2, which also launched from Vandenberg uh, back in uh, late in the fall of 2018. Spectacular launch, went off without a hitch. I wish I could have been there, but uh, but I wasn't. Um, but this is how we got on orbit, how our, our uh, trusty little satellite got on orbit. And this is what the satellite looks like. Uh, this is a, uh, an animation, of course, but this is what it 
uh, hypothetically looks like flying through space. So ISAT has one, uh, one instrument on board. It's called ATLAS, the Advanced Topographic Laser Altimeter System, ATLAS. And ATLAS is a laser that, uh, that shoots uh, laser pulses that bounce off of the surface of the Earth back into that opening that you see there in the video, which is a telescope. And that measurement can give us the uh, a very precise measurement of the surface elevation of wherever the laser bounced off of, um, for example, the ice sheets and sea ice. And what's more important is that it can measure change with of that elevation over time. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, this laser fires 10 kilohertz, at uh, 10 kilohertz, 10,000 times every second. Um, and it can time uh, every one of those pulses to within one billionth of a second. And that's how we get this very precise measurement of, um, of the surface elevation um, of the Earth. So we've had 1,400 days on orbit since the satellite launched. Uh, we turned Atlas on uh, in October of 2018, and since then, Atlas has fired over one trillion laser pulses. So that's a huge number, and it's still going strong. I'm going to knock on some wood here somewhere. Um, Atlas has uh, has six beams. Six laser beams are shot down to the surface of the Earth. You can see those six beams in our picture here on the left, <clears throat> um, and they're arranged in pairs. And uh, the reason for that is because uh, in addition to getting the surface, uh, the elevation of the surface, the six beams allow us to get a measurement of the surface slope as well. And that's a very important critical thing to being able to measure um, the, the elevation change with time. So we have these six beams, it fires 10,000 times a second, um, and we've been able to collect all these measurements um, over the last almost four years. So that's a little bit about ISAT-2, the satellite and the mission. And now I'm going to um, show you the kinds of measurements that we've made over the ice sheets of the Earth. Um, here's a little animation that shows the, the lasers, the six lasers uh, that are going by and um, measuring surface topography of, of one particular part of Greenland here. You can see how the, the topography can be very complex uh, as the satellite flies overhead, it's going to measure things like ice, snow that's sitting on top of the ice, mountains that are peeking out above over the ice, and of course, pesky clouds that get in the way and, and mess up all of our measurements of the ground. But on a clear day, we get very good measurements of the ground. Um, I, I'll just touch on this a little tiny bit, but this is a very, a very important part of every satellite mission that NASA flies. Is, a, is validating the data that the satellite is collecting. In other words, how do we know that the measurements that we're getting from the satellite are actually accurate and precise to the level that we think they need to be? Uh, we do that by, by going to places uh, that, are the, that our satellite is trying to measure and taking ground measurements for validation. So this is video from um, a field campaign that happened very near the South Pole in Antarctica. Uh, and you can see this sled of instruments that uh, were was driving behind this, um, this snow machine that are taking very precise measurements on the ground of the surface. And what happens is we use these measurements and compare them to the measurements that the satellite takes when it flies over the same part of the ice sheet. And that comparison gives us an idea of how accurate our satellite measurements are. So these, these validation campaigns happen in several different places on Earth and can happen multiple years to see if our satellite precision is changing with time. Um, let's take a look at the Greenland ice sheet. So here we're zooming into a, to one part of it to see how we actually calculate the measurement of uh, surface elevation change with time. Um, in purple here, I'm going to pause the video for one second, are where we took measurements with the original ISAT satellite that operated from 2003 to 2009. And in green, we have our uh, measurements from ISAT-2, um, which started taking measurements in 2018 and is still taking measurements today. Wherever these two satellites, uh, wherever their measurements intersect on the ground, we can compare what the height of the ice sheet was back when ISAT took its measurement against the height uh, that ISAT-2 is measuring. And that way we get a rate of change over time. 
So once we zoom back out, what you'll see is the ice sheet thinning wherever you see red and thickening wherever you see blue colors. So in Greenland, the story is that around the edges of the ice sheet, we're getting a lot of thinning over time. Um, that's where fast flowing outlet glaciers are really stretching and thinning over time. We're getting increased melt year after year, and that melt is making the ice sheet thin there over time. And so using these satellites, we can very precisely make these measurements and, uh, and actually start to see these interesting spatial patterns and measure overall what the state of the ice sheet is. So how much ice is being lost over, over this time. Um, one interesting thing is that what you'll notice in the middle of the ice sheet, uh, you're going to see a lot of blue colors here. And that's actually because of increased snowfall that can happen as the result of a warming climate. A warming climate can in some parts of the earth mean a wetter climate. And in Greenland, a wetter climate means you get more snowfall that falls in the winter. Unfortunately, that extra snowfall that we're starting to get is not enough to counterbalance all of the the losses that we're getting around the, the edge of the ice sheet. If we go to the South Pole now and we look at Antarctica, uh, here we're taking measurements in much the same way. So here in purple, again, we have the original ice sat measurements. And in green, we're going to overlay where ice sat 2 is taking measurements. You can see it's a much more dense spatial pattern with the newer satellite. And again, wherever the tracks cross, we can get a rate of change over time. So we'll zoom back out, and what you'll see is that in Antarctica, the pattern is way more complex than in Greenland. For example, this one particular uh, ice stream, the CAM ice stream that's labeled here, uh, has been thickening quite a bit over time. And that's because a very interesting thing has been happening there. This is an ice stream that used to flow very fast from the center of the ice sheet out to an ice shelf and then out to the ocean. Um, uh, Recently, in geologic terms recently, that ice sheet stagnated, meaning it stopped flowing. And once that ice stream stops flowing, it starts to build up ice behind it. So this particular ice stream has actually been thickening over time. But again, in Antarctica, even though this story is a little bit more complicated and there are interesting patterns of gain, thickening, and, and loss with thinning, overall, uh, Antarctica is losing uh, mass over time. So that ice loss that we're measuring around the whole ice sheet um, ends up directly contributing to sea level rise. I'll just pause the video here again very quickly because during this record, there was also increased snowfall in certain parts of Antarctica. And uh, here in a, this particular region that we've zoomed into, where you can see the strong blue colors, this is also as a result of increasing snowfall. Um, these kind of measurements are actually very important when we try to build better models of the ice sheets and of the Earth's climate. We use these models to try to predict what's going to happen with the ice sheets and the Earth's climate over the next 100 years. And these measurements that we take with ISAT2, as well as with a whole host of other NASA satellites, help us to calibrate and tune those models so that we get much better predictions over time. So basically, we can compare. Did our model get this snowfall correct, well, we can compare with the snowfall that ISAT2 measured and kind of fine tune things and get a better prediction when we go forward. So that's kind of the story of the two ice sheets, Greenland on the left, Antarctica on the right. Um, the, the, today's story is that both ice sheets are losing mass. They're changing shape in what can be complex patterns, some thickening, some thinning around the ice sheets, but when we add everything up overall, both ice sheets are losing mass, and that's uh, contributing directly to sea level rise. In fact, half of the measured sea level rise that we have around the globe is due to shrinking ice around the entire Earth. All righty, I think that's it for my portion. So, Stephen, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Sounds great. Thank you, Dennis. I'll go ahead and share that as well. So yeah, I guess, uh, thanks, Dennis. Um, yeah, so we'll be switching over now to talk about the sea ice. So we're going from ice that was on land on Greenland and Antarctica, and now look at the ice that is floating on the oceans at both poles. 
Um, so sea ice is, is really interesting, maybe at least to me, but it's, it's, it's interesting because it covers a, such a vast area, but it covers in only a very thin blanket of ice. So the area might be millions of square miles um, when its thickness is only you know, a few meters at the most um, in, 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 an, in any given area. So this is what the global sea ice cover looks like. On the left side here, we have the Northern Hemisphere. And on the right side, we have the Southern Hemisphere sea ice. And what's immediately apparent is the, the seasonality of the ice. You can see it sort of ebbs and flows. It moves around a lot. And the extent or the aerial coverage changes as you march through time. So you can see the, the time sort of uh, move onward on the bottom. And in the Northern Hemisphere summer, you might have very thin ice, uh, or sorry, very uh, small ice extent. And the opposite is true in the Southern Hemisphere at that same time. So they're, they're quite literally polar opposites. When uh, one has a very large ice extent, like is seen here in the Southern Hemisphere, we see a very small ice extent uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. So much like Dennis showed with change in ice over time, you can do the same thing with sea ice. Now, because it's so seasonal and sort of follows the cyclic pattern, uh, we like to focus on a single month or a single season and look at how that uh, single time snapshot changes throughout the years. So this animation shows the change in Arctic sea ice area at its minimum every year. So it's the minimum area typically occurs around September of each year. So this is looking at the sea ice, ex the sea ice aerial coverage in September from every year between the late 1970s and today. And most of you may be familiar with the story of Arctic sea ice in that uh, you've probably heard it's melting, the sea ice is, is declining. And we can see that pretty dramatically with this figure here. Now, what you can see year to year is that there's quite a lot of variability in that some years the, the ice area here might increase before decreasing the next year and sort of wiggle throughout time. But if you look at the overall trend in the overall graph here, we see a pretty marked decline in this minimum sea ice area. So much so that before 1990, the uh, area here never dropped below 6 million square kilometers. Whereas since 2010, we've never gotten above 5 million square kilometers. So when you look over this longer time series, you sort of start to see uh, just the dramatic declines in, in the uh, Arctic sea ice area over time. So we can look at area from above. We can also look at the age of sea ice. So when, when you look sort of at a picture, uh, the sea ice looks uniform. It looks like a single ice pack, when in reality, it's made up of many different sea ice parcels. And these parcels can be tracked using satellite data. And you can see essentially how long they stick around in the Arctic Ocean. And therefore, you can figure out its age of the ice. So what this graph is showing here is the relative percents of different ages of sea ice uh, over time. So starting in 1985 until 2019. And you can see that early on in the time series, more than 30% of the ice in the Arctic Ocean was more than four years old. If you sort of step through through the years, you can see this red value diminishes to almost nothing by 2019. And what's really starting to dominate the Arctic ice cover is not this old ice that's been around for many years, but it's actually newer ice, ice that's a year old or less. And that's what's shown in these, these figures here on the right. This is looking at the same week, March 12th through the 18th, both in 1985 and 2019. And you can see in 1985, most of the Arctic Ocean consists of ice that is four or more years old when in 2019, you can see there's almost no ice that's four or more years old. And instead, there's much more ice that's between zero and one year. So this is some of the things we can, can look at, um, look at the sea ice cover from above using the satellite data. And typically, on average, we say that the Arctic sea ice cover is getting smaller and younger throughout time. So that is kind of one way to look at the ice cover. Uh, but there's another way to look at it, and that's in this third dimension. And that's looking at the thickness of sea ice. And this is where ice at two comes into play. So when we talk about the thickness of sea ice, what we're referring to is the height of the sea ice, both above and below the water line. So this little diagram here is, is sort of a, an example sea ice uh, parcel, like I mentioned, that's floating in the water. 
and a large portion of the ice is below the water line. There'll be some above the water and then perhaps a, a snow cover on top. So we want to measure the, this thickness from space, um, but when most of it's below the water line, that becomes very challenging. It's tough to see with the laser uh, underneath the water surface. So if we want to estimate the sea ice thickness, we instead rely on a different measurement in my set to known as the sea ice freeboard. The freeboard is just the height of the ice and the snow above the water line. And if we have this freeboard measurement, we can, uh, we're able to estimate the thickness. Now, in order to do this, we have to think back to our high school science classes and the Archimedes principle, which basically states that anything that's floating in a fluid exhibits a buoyant force, uh, essentially to keep it floating. So what we can do is we can do some fancy math. Um, we just need to know a few things, the density of these different layers. So the density of the snow, the ice and the water. We need to know the snow layer on top. But then if we combine uh, that information with the freeboard estimates from ISAT2, we can put that all together and estimate the thickness of sea ice. So that's, this is really the important measurement in this little equation here is the freeboard. And that's what we can get with ISAT2. So if we were to look at sea ice uh, from a boat, let's say, this is what it might look like. We see the water level. And again, you can't, it's tough to see what's actually below it. But we see some ice sticking out above and then a snow layer on top. There's a little bird hanging out for scale. Um, so the freeboard here would be the top of the snow layer down to the water level. And this is what I said you can see and what can help us estimate the thickness. So in order to do this, we use the extremely precise height measurements from I set two of the sea ice surface and then also the height measurements of the surrounding ocean. And if we take the two elevations and we just subtract them, we can get a measure of the freeboard. So in reality, it's very simple. It's measuring two things um, and just subtracting them. But in, in practice, it's maybe a little more complicated. But this animation shows exactly how this is done for my set too. So we have our height of the water, we have our height of the ice, um, have, which allows us to get the freeboard, and then we can estimate the thickness. Now, the, the ice cover isn't entirely closed off. There's a lot of motion and movement, and these cracks open and close in the ice throughout the year. And now ice set two is continuously flying around the globe, and these cracks just sort of open and close all the time. So as ice set two flies over, it can get these sea surface measurements, and it combines that with the nearby ice height measurements to, to, uh, to calculate the freeboard. And you can see here, ice, ice set two flies around and around over, the, over both poles. Um, and collects these freeboard measurements. Uh, now, before I get to, to the thickness, I do also want to touch on, on some of the precision and the accuracy of ice set two. The title of the talk is, after all, a precise look at ice. Um, so how can we ensure that the measurements that we're getting from ice set two are actually precise enough to be useful, especially over sea ice, where um, it's relatively thin and, and every centimeter matters? We do this from a couple of reasons, or, or a couple of ways we can do this. Uh, one of them is being actually on the ground and collecting these validation measurements um, of, of the sea ice surface beneath ice set two. So this is just one example field campaign known as Mosaic. Um, and this is where a, a ship, an icebreaker, was frozen into the Arctic sea ice and left to drift for a year. And many scientists joined this expedition and collected tons and tons of sea ice data uh, for this entire uh, year in order to help a variety of different measurements. So one of my jobs on Mosaic was to collect sea ice information to help validate the estimates that we're getting from ice set two. So if we want to validate the thickness, we need to know the actual thickness of the ice. So one way this can be done is by very simply measuring the thickness of ice. In this case, drill a hole through the ice, stick essentially a tape measure down there and see how thick the ice is. These are really useful measurements because you can get the exact thickness at a, at a one uh, specific point, and you can compare against ice set two. So while this is super accurate and a great way to do it, it only covers a small spatial area. You can only walk so far. So another way that we validate these ice set two measurements are by using aircraft. So on Mosaic, uh, there are different ways to do this. On Mosaic in particular, we used a helicopter, and we mounted an instrument that's very similar to ice set two underneath, and we flew directly beneath an ice set two orbit. And by doing this, we're measuring the same ice from two different instruments, and we're able to compare the two and assess how well I said two is estimating the sea ice height and the freeboard in order to estimate the thickness. 
So just how precise are these ISATU measurements? This is just a plot of some data that we might look at from ISATU. So this is showing the along track heights over the sea ice for a, a, a certain length track orbit in the Arctic Ocean. So you can see as we fly along the orbit, the sea ice surface changes quite a bit. There are some high peaks, of what we call ridges, and there are some low, uh, lower kind of flatter ice. And when we, when we want to determine the precision of ice set two, we look at how much the ice set two measurements vary over a surface that we would expect to be relatively flat. So that's what's shown in these red boxes here. These are sea ice leads, as I mentioned, the cracks that open in the ice. When these cracks open, the sea ice sur or the sea surface within them is very smooth and can be uh, quite long, actually. So what we do is we see how much the ice set two heights vary over the smooth surface. We don't expect them to vary very much, um, but in these two examples, they vary very little between, uh, this is 1.9 and 1.5 centimeters. So here we say the precision of ice set two is better than two centimeters, uh, which is for one, very useful when we're talking about sea ice that isn't that thick in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but also the satellite is hundreds of kilometers away taking these measurements and getting precision within a couple of centimeters, um, which, is, which is really fantastic. So this is, this is what we know, this is what we refer to as the long track sea ice data, uh, sort of these profiles. And we can take these profiles and, and aggregate the, them together to find the thickness of the sea ice. So here's this animation just shows how we come up with sort of a broad scale view of the sea ice thickness. Each of these green lines here is an orbit from my statue flying over the Arctic. So any given day and month, there'll be many, many orbits that fly. And the animation shown here in the top left is showing how I said to sort of illuminates the sea ice thickness beneath a given orbit. So you can see it's flying along and it shows a thickness of most of the time less than 10 meters. Sometimes uh, very thick ridges, you might see 10 meters, but most of the time it's under two meters. And I said to you can, um, provide these thicknesses and these freeboards along track. And you can see these along track measurements uh, will eventually cross each other. And if you look back on the map, over the course of a given time period, uh, many, many of these along track measurements can be aggregated to get a sense of the overall thickness of the sea ice. So for example, this is a month of data and you can see just how many tracks there are. And we can aggregate all of these along track and find the mean in different grid cells throughout the Arctic. So that's what's shown here. This is looking at the thickness of the sea ice across the entire Arctic Ocean. Here, the purple values are generally the thicker ice when the lighter white values tend to be thinner. And it follows a similar pattern from year to year. The thickest ice is located north of Greenland and along uh, the Canadian archipelago, while thinner ice can be found uh, more inland in the, in the Arctic Ocean. So this is sort of this uh, spatial measure of the sea ice thickness that we can get from ice set two. Now this is great, but as, as Dennis showed with land ice, we also wanna look at the change over time. Um, so we can do this using these sort of monthly maps of sea ice thickness. So that's what's shown here. Uh, if we move uh, top to bottom, this is looking at November, December, January, and February of the three different years. 2018 to 2019, 2019 to 2020, and 2020 to 2021 across. So if we just look at one of these months, let's say November on the top, you can see again, the thickest ice along the coast and thinner further away, but we can see the change in the November thickness from 2018 to 2019 to 2020. And you can see there's many, there's much more dark uh, blues in this case, thicker ice in 2018. By the time you get to 2020, there's a lot uh, a lot less of this thick ice. So even in this, this kind of short time period, we can see changes in the thickness of the Arctic sea ice. Now, if you remember back to the area map, uh, a short time is useful, but maybe not in telling you exactly what the trends are doing, right? There was a lot of variability from year to year. So while three years from ice set is, is great and useful, if we want to actually see what the uh, what the sea ice cover is doing, we need to look at a longer time scale. So in that case, we need to utilize some other satellites uh, to get a sense of the overall Arctic sea ice uh, cover and how it changes. 
So this is exactly that. It's looking at the Arctic sea ice um, from three different satellite missions. And what this is showing is the volume. Essentially, the sea ice volume is just the thickness multiplied by the area. And that gives us, essentially, you can think of it as the thickness. Because if you look at these triangles right here, these are the volume estimates from ISAT 2 shown on the plot on the left. And you can see this decrease in the volume or decrease in the thickness over these last three years. But again, if we want this longer term trend, we need to go back in time. So we use the Cryosat 2 satellite, which was launched in 2010. And we can use the original ISAT mission, which was in the early 2000s. And we can calculate the thickness from these different months and the volume over time and see how it's changing. So the red points here are the, uh, the, is the sea ice thickness for the months of February and March over time, while blue is the October and November sea ice thickness. And the, the red lines, February and March, is losing on average uh, 250 cubic kilometers a year uh, in sea ice volume over this time range while well, October and November is losing more than 400 cubic kilometers a year. Uh, it's a tough sort of unit to wrap your head around. Each of these is millions of Olympic-sized swimming pools of ice that are, lo that are lost um, every year. So when we use ISAT-2 and these other satellites, we can say that on average, the sea ice cover is not only getting smaller and younger, but it's also getting thinner over time. Now, we could, we could end the talk here and say ice is melting both in the sea and on land where the ice sheets are losing mass, the sea ice is shrinking, um, end of talk. But of course, that's, that's maybe not, doesn't paint the entire picture. What we can also look at both from, uh, we can kind of move from these historical measurements from ISAT2 and other satellites and move towards future projections and see what the ice may do um, moving forward. So this, this figure here is looking at projections from the IPCC. You may have heard about this or read about it in the news. It's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And every few years, they put out reports on the state of the climate uh, and cut sort of what's happening in different sectors and different um, sort of biomes all around the world. And what this is showing here is the projected global mean sea level rise under different scenarios, essentially modeling what this the, the future sea level rise might look like. Now, the, the biggest thing here to note is that, um, Dennis actually mentioned this as well, is that this historical baseline uh, is extremely useful for these projections. And this is where ISAT2 comes into play. Um, ISAT2 looks at the ice loss in Greenland and in, in Antarctica and can feed into these models by establish, establishing this historical baseline of ice loss. So we take these uh, ice at two measurements, we can calculate the sea level rise that has happened under, in the ice at two period and before, and we set this baseline. And from there, we can run different models and different model projections and see what may happen in the future. And again, it feels like lots of ice is melting and that will essentially doom. But when you think about uh, what still can be done, that we like to say hope is not all entirely lost. What these different curves are showing is are different. Uh, pathways essentially of, of what humanity can take moving forward. You can see the red, red lines near the top are essentially if nothing is done and if uh, emissions and the way people live doesn't change or gets worse, what we'll, we may see uh, increased sea level rise in the future. However, if governments start to act, if we start to reduce emissions and change how we live, there's still a lot we can do as far as, in this case, sea level rise, and that we can limit what actually happens in the future. So again, it's, it's, hope is not lost. And these, these models are extremely useful in, in um, telling what may happen in the future. And measurements from missions like I said too are extremely useful in setting this historical baseline so that we can accurately model what might happen in the future. So that's most of what we're going to talk about uh, today. If you're interested in learning more, there's a lot of great resources out there, uh, specifically here from NASA that can, um, that can help uh, provide more information. So some of them are uh, on the left here are more earth science focused um, information from NASA. So one of them is the earthobservatory.nasa.gov. This is a great collection of blogs and articles and maps 
showing um, NASA Earth science missions and different uh, data and how things have changed over time. Of course, if you're interested in ISAT2, you can check out the ISAT2 homepage listed here. Uh, this also gives a lot of informa more information about the satellite and some of the data that's coming from it. And then if you're interested in sort of the climate uh, application, the climate info, there's two really great sites here, climate.nasa.gov. This provides sort of a one-stop shop looking at um, a dashboard of how the Earth is changing. So you can see here, it just gives sim uh, simple single numbers on what the Arctic sea ice extent has been doing recently, how the ice sheets are changing, and then other parameters like CO2 and temperature. Um, and this comes from NASA missions and, and other work overall. And finally, for the younger folks in the audience, or if anyone uh, knows younger folks that might be interested in, in the climate, uh, climatekids.nasa.gov is, is a fantastic resource that uh, sort of boils down some of this, this climate information to, to a younger audience. Um, and also talks about different NASA Earth science missions that go into um, a lot of this climate work. So if you're interested, definitely feel free to check out some of these resources. Uh, and with that, we just want to say thank you. Thanks, thanks to uh, especially the Wild Wing Museum, Stacey and Lauren, for, for inviting us. This is, this is a rare treat, and it's uh, been a lot of fun. Um, of course, we have to thank the ISAT2 uh, teams, the instrument and the science teams. Without them, uh, there wouldn't be a satellite, and we wouldn't have anything to talk about here. Uh, so thanks, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. Um, yeah, really appreciate it, and we're happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, thank you both so much. I mean, what a fascinating talk, um, and and putting it in such a easy to understand um, presentation. I know me personally, it can get overwhelming hearing about all of these climate change statistics, but you've painted it so beautifully and made it so easy to understand. So thank you. Um, and I'll, I know um, some of you may have missed our top uh, announcement that our chat seems to be restricted at the moment. So just if you have questions, please put them in our Q&A box. If you're thinking of them as we're chatting here, um, I know I jotted down one, I was just curious, it looked in your presentation like the original ISAT satellite lived for six years. Is there a sense of the lifespan of uh, ISAT-2 and, and how long these kinds of instruments can, can take measurements? Yeah, so um, we've been pretty lucky with ISAT-2. Um, and it can it can really vary um the the length of the how, how you know how long a satellite can stay up can vary because we can get unlucky so the the interesting thing is that typically nasa satellites are designed to fly for what might seem like a short amount of time five years um sometimes a little bit longer um sometimes even shorter than that but typically they they stay up there for longer um and uh, with ISAT-2, we've been pretty lucky. The laser uh, instrument itself has been very stable over time. Um, it's The satellite has to use fuel every so often to bump up its orbit because um, there's actually still a small amount of atmosphere, even at the height that the satellite flies at, which um, causes the satellite to fall basically pretty slowly towards the Earth. So every once in a while, it bumps itself back up. And it hasn't been using fuel at a faster rate than we expected. Um, and so all told, um, the projections, again, I'm going to knock on lots of wood here in my house, but the projections for how long the satellite can stay out there and take measurements uh, projecting out are pretty long, like, you know, over 10, more than 10 years from now. So fingers are crossed that all goes well and, and that that happens. And, you know, it's it's pretty rare that that happens. We NASA does have some examples of satellites that have been operating for uh, quite a long time. And those records, those long records are extremely valuable because it's the same instrument taking the same measurement over and over again. Um, whenever you bring a new satellite on, on board, the instrument has its own little quirks and biases. And, you know, you have to sort of figure that stuff out and connecting the dots between one mission to another, one instrument type to a different type can be, can be a challenge. So it's really rare that we get these super long records. Um, but so far, so good with ISAT2, and we're hoping that it continues to, to stay healthy and uh, take these critical measurements for a long time. 
Great, thank you. Um, let me see here. We have a question from Hillary. Do you feel there is time for the planet to come together to first stall or slow down the inevitable? It seems the loss of polar ice is occurring exponentially. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And that's kind of what I tried to try to illustrate there is that it it does sort of feel like doom <laughs> these days. You hear a lot about um, a lot about the melting ice, and it seems like yeah, every news story you hear is a negative one. Um, but if you if you start to look at the the climate projections and under especially under those different pathways, um, it it shows that there's a lot you can do. If if people start to work together, if we start to limit emissions um, and things like that, then we can really limit some of the um, sort of some of the potential disaster, if you will, um, and, and sort of keep things, um, yeah, more reasonable for, for a longer period of time. Thank you. And then uh, Valerie asked, why is it important to have thick sea ice or large extent? Yeah, that's a great question, Valerie. Um, as, as Dennis showed in the beginning, the extent is, is especially important um, because of mainly because of the influence of the albedo. When you have a large extent, then you tend to reflect more solar radiation back out to space. And then that essentially that radiation doesn't get absorbed by the Earth and by the oceans. So it limits the warming that we see, uh, especially in the polar regions. So with large extents, uh, we see more, uh, yeah, more solar radiation uh, reflected back to space. And as that extent starts to shrink, then as Dennis also mentioned, the, you start to see some of these feedback loops, um, which causes the extent to shrink more and so on and so forth. Now, thick sea ice is, is a little more nuanced. Um, essentially, the, what the sea ice does by sitting at, uh, sitting at the interface between the ocean and the atmosphere is it acts as uh, sort of a, a blanket, if you will. It, instead of allowing heat from the ocean to just uh, go directly into the atmosphere where it can warm the atmosphere more. Essentially, it buffers that and it keeps a lot of that heat um, in essentially in the ocean so that it doesn't warm the atmosphere. And the ocean can be a really good sink of, of uh, some of this heat that would otherwise warm the planet a lot faster. So the thicker sea ice, the thicker sea ice we have, um, generally the longer it sticks around, and the longer it sticks around, the more it can sort of contain some of that heat. Uh, where we want to keep it instead of instead of in the atmosphere. Great, and I did want to point out um, Valerie, who is also with NASA, has been sharing some helpful links um, through our Q and A box in lieu of our chat. Um, if anyone is interested in clicking through those, and I will definitely try to put those links that uh, Stephen saved at the end also in our recording description for those who are interested. And you can also always email us as well. Um, are there any last questions from the audience? And Valerie says, especially check out that gigaton vis visualization that she shared. That was her last link, I think, three up from the bottom. So I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I, I read and follow a bit about climate change for many reasons, and um, you hear a lot about Thwaites Glacier or the Doomsday, you know, glacier, um, and not a lot about other things. Like, there's just a lot of immediate attention about that. So I didn't know if you wanted to say anything about that or put it into maybe that broader context of what's happening in Antarctica. Yeah, Thwaites Glacier has, yeah, uh, it has been getting a lot of attention recently. Um, it's some some folks like to call it the Doomsday Glacier. Um, it's one particular glacier that has been changing very rapidly, especially in the la over the last twenty or so years, and uh, it's it's changing by thinning and and losing a lot of mass uh, of its mass, a lot of its ice to the ocean. Um, the big unknown question uh, about Thwaites Glacier in particular, and about a couple of, you know, other glaciers are similar, but Thwaites is kind of the big one that we, um, we don't know whether it's entered into a state of what we call unstable retreat. So all glaciers 
go through periods of retreat and advance and retreat and advance over time. Um, over the last 20 or so years, most glaciers around the ice sheet and around the whole, uh, both ice sheets and the earth have been mostly retreating. Um, Thwaites Glacier is especially important because if it retreats enough, it could kick off um, many, many decades of unstable future retreat that can't be stopped. Even if we were to turn off climate change, the glacier would just keep retreating. And that's because of this dynamic imbalance that happens in the flow of the ice itself. Um, but it's actually still an open question, an open research question of whether that glacier is actually in that dynamic imbalance state. And so recently, the U.S. and uh, researchers in, uh, in Europe have teamed up together and put in a lot of funding uh, for different research teams to sort of look at this problem from different perspectives. That's part of the reason that Thwaites has in particular been in the news a lot recently. Um, but like I said, it's it, that question has not been definitively answered. So as a community, we don't know whether it's in this dynamic imbalanced state or whether it's not. And if we mitigate future warming, maybe that glacier will stop retreating at some point. Um, so uh, that's kind of the big, you, one of the big open questions in Antarctica. Um, and the reason it gets a lot of attention is because that glacier is huge and moves a lot of ice from the ice sheet out to the ocean. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so it, it's still an open research question and, and a very good one that a lot of experts are working on right now to try to get a better understanding. Thank you. And I will say just a connection to our show, um, Xavier Cortada, one of the artists in the Fire and Ice exhibit, he has a piece that's titled Thwaites um, that has sediment and ice that he collected on, that's framed on paper. So that is, the glacier is in the show. And then I may have just missed it in, in the presentation, but I was curious, so how many rotations is the satellite doing in a given period? I mean, how often are you getting data that you're having to analyze? Because it seems like it's a lot. Great question. I was gonna see if Stephen, you wanted to jump in. Um, the satellite uh, orbits the earth, I think, Actually, I'm sure Valerie can correct me if I'm wrong, or Stephen. Um, something like once every ninety-ish minutes. Wow. Um, okay. So it's it's flying pretty fast. Um, if I I'm going to get this number a little bit wrong, but it's something like twelve kilometers per second. That's how fast um, it's flying in orbit. So it does one rotation about every ninety minutes, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, so. Uh, but but the you know what the the way it works is that the set the Earth is spinning underneath as the satellite is orbiting overhead. So it takes um, some time for the satellite's orbit to pass over the same place on the Earth again. Um, the way that the ISA two orbit is designed, it will fly over the same spot on the Earth every ninety one days. So basically, once per season, we get a measurement. Um, in the same spot on Earth. And that's what helps us track um, seasonal changes of, of the, the ice sheet, the, the ice sheets and sea ice. So that's how we can measure how much are they shrinking in the summer, how much are they growing in the winter. And then, you know, over time, over the years, we get those repeat measurements very precisely um, to really nail down that measurement. Um, but yeah, it's about once every 90 minutes it passes, or it does a complete orbit, excuse me, around the Earth. Wow, thank you. Oh, and Valerie says, and, and it goes, yeah, over the same area of Earth every 91 days. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we can um, promote Valerie to panelists, and, and we, <laughs> we've been emailing, you know, with her, and she recruited you guys, and so, Valerie, I can't talk to you, but I'm going to go ahead and promote you, so <laughs> hope you don't mind. Be nice to see her. Okay, I promoted, now what? <laughs> <laughs> there she is. <laughs> so Valerie, oh. you're welcome if you want to. I have to unmute. Hi, everyone. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful presentation. I'm, 
I am so excited and I love that that you're combining the art and climate change and science. I think it's fantastic. I would love to be able to uh, attend the exhibit, but unfortunately we can't come out there. So <laughs> we'll just have to uh, live vicariously through you all or through the visitors who come through. Well, we really appreciate you guys um, helping out, sharing all your amazing information, all the research that you do. And I know Valerie helped coordinate um, all of that. So we're really grateful to all three of you. And thanks to technology, um, we were able to do it through Zoom. So I'm really grateful. Uh, are there any final questions from our attendees at this point? Sounds kind of quiet. So <laughs> I think with that, um, we have been recording this. I think Lauren's already said that. So uh, she, we will get it on our computer and get it loaded up to our YouTube channel. We have a whole YouTube channel of other past presentations as well. So uh, feel free to check those out really anytime. And Lauren, I think you're going to email folks when it's ready, right? Yes, you'll get an auto email with the link um, to see it on YouTube when that's ready. And we usually get it up within 48 hours, if not sooner. Great. Well, Stephen, Dennis, Valerie, thank you guys so much. Really wonderful presentation. I was able to understand, I think, all of it, or certainly most of it. <laughs> um, so we're just really grateful. Yes, likewise. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Right. This was wonderful. We'll definitely be promoting the um, recording out there. Right. Yeah, and I'll, I'll oh, email great. you all directly as well. So you'll have that. Great. Wonderful. All right. Well, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 Yeah.